next talk. Uh, and the next talk is given by Professor Krishnan. The title is Explicit Inversion Formulas for Normal Operators of Momentum Ray Transform. Professor Krishnan, please. What about the sound? We we don't we don't hear you. Oh yeah yeah sorry. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I muted myself. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Professor Belishev, uh, for this very kind introduction. And I was in Saint Petersburg a couple of iterations of this uh, conference. And uh, anyway, so it's it's uh, it's great to be uh, giving a talk online. And uh, before I begin, um, this is a joint work with uh, Shubham Jatar Manaskar, who are in India, and uh, Professor uh, Vladimir Sharofidinov, who does not need any introduction anywhere in the world, especially in Russia. And uh, 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 this this talk, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's there in archive, and this is the archive link. And Shubham and Manas, Shubham was a student here at uh, not in my institute, but in another institute. And Manas is uh, is a faculty member in a, in a different institute in India. Uh, oops. Yes, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, especially Professor Mikhail Belishev for this very kind invitation. Okay, so the, 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 the talk is going to be about ray transform, but ray transform of symmetric tensor fields. So symmetric tensor fields, uh, F, uh, I denote it as F I1, I2 up to IM, and then I'm going to focus exclusively in the Euclidean case and, and all of Rn. And uh, symmetric means that any permutation of these indices it does not change the value. And uh, the ray transform uh, is given as follows. So it's uh, the integral. Uh, you know, you can think of it as dot product for the case of vector fields, but uh, it's like a quadratic form. And then the integral if of x comma psi uh, of this. And uh, uh, our goal is to recover this f from this if, right? So given this if for all x comma c in Rn cross Rn minus zero, we would like to recover this f. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind is that uh, this has the following homogeneity relations, I f of x plus. So if you just translate it along the uh, the line, uh, then the integral doesn't change. And also it has, uh, you know, in the second variable, it has this particular homogeneity relations. Just It just comes from the change of variable formula. Okay, so for because of these homogeneity relations, the fact that you can, you can translate along the line of integration and also that... Uh, it's enough to restrict this C to be in the unit in the unit sphere. Uh, so we can actually consider those X C such that X is perpendicular to C and C is in S and minus one. And uh, uh, this is actually well known. It's a manifold of uh, oriented straight lines. And uh, uh, it's, you know, it's parameterized by this T S and minus one. So that is the tangent bundle to the unit sphere. So this is X comma C such that mod c is equal to one, and then you fix the direction c, and then you consider the plane which is perpendicular to that particular c, and then you use that plane as your starting point for the lines of integration. Okay, so, uh, so from now on, we are only going to consider the case in which uh, the, the, the ray transform is defined on Tsn minus one. And uh, you consider the Schwartz space uh, in which each component of the tensor field is a Schwartz class function. And uh, you also consider the Schwartz space on this Tsn minus one. So roughly speaking, you can think of this as the non-compact part. So the, 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 the Sn minus one, that's a compact part. And then you have the plane. So you roughly want that along the plane, it should, it should, it should uh, be a Schwartz class function. And uh, it is well known that the ray transform is a bounded linear operator from the Schwartz class to the Schwartz class on this Tsn minus one. And the ray transform is already what we, what we already saw. Okay, and ray transforms arises in a wide variety of applications. It's, it's, it's very well known to uh, the community. Uh, for instance, for the case of functions, it arises in computerized tomography. For the case of vector fields, Doppler, uh, 
symmetric two tensor fields, it arises as a linearization of the travel time tomography problem. Uh, and four arises in anisotropic the tomography of anisotropic media. So for instance, you know, if you look at the book of Sharaf uh, integral geometry of tensor fields, you know, uh, it's 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 very well presented there. And um, this theory, you know, the, the, the ray transforms has been, you know, it has been studied by several people, not just in the Euclidean setting, but also in the manifold setting. And, uh, you know, there are giants in this field, uh, uh, and in, including Professor Romano, who just gave a talk. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, the difficulty in ray transforms, uh, especially when compared to functions and, uh, you know, um, other, you know, higher order objects like vector fields or symmetric two tensor fields, is that the ray transform has an infinite dimensional kernel for any M. M is the rank of the tensor field. And it's a theorem due to Sharaf Fidinov that uh, a symmetric tensor field can be uniquely decomposed into its so-called solenoidal and potential parts. So what are the solenoidal and potential parts? This Fs, that is a solenoidal part. And then this dv here is the potential part. And the solenoidal part is the divergence-free part. And the potential is some uh, d of a one order less symmetric tensor field, uh, which is v is of order uh, of uh, you know rank or order m minus one. And uh, um, this satisfies certain conditions, certain growth or uh, decay conditions. Uh, you know, we, we don't need to worry about that right now. So what we have is we have this decomposition, and it's a it's a it's an easy exercise to show that uh, uh, because of this v of x going to zero as mod x goes to infinity, that any dv part here is going to be in the um, kernel of the ray trans. And by the way, this is a generalization of the Helmholtz decomposition. Uh, for vector field, which is uh, which is probably more uh, well known. So the point being that uh, since I, dv is in the kernel, so the best that one can hope for is to recover this the solenoidal part of the uh, symmetric tensor field from ray transform data. And uh, in fact, this is also um, well studied. Uh, before that, you know, I, I introduced these two operators. Uh, this Fs over here, the, the, the delta, which is the divergence, and then this D here, which is a symmetrized, in, in, the, in the Riemannian setting, it's a symmetrized covariant derivative, but now you can just think of the same covariant derivative, but the Christoffel symbols being equal to zero. And uh, you can actually, because of the symmetry, you can actually write this in the following fashion. So that is your uh, D operator. Uh, which is called the inner derivative. And then this uh, delta here is the divergence. You can think of divergence along each uh, e e each index. And it doesn't matter. You can take any of these indices. It's going to be the same because of the fact that F is uh, symmetric. And as I already mentioned, the potential part always lies in the null space. And one can actually recover the solenoidal component. In fact, there is an explicit inversion formula and uh, due to Sharaf Kudinov. And before I do that, uh, let me just uh, you know briefly mention how the proof works for the case of uh, uh, the ray transform before we get into the momentum setup. So, um, what, so what we do is the following: we compute the formal L two adjoint of, of the operator i, and it's actually going to be given by this averaging operator. And then the uh, usual uh, standard thing in the field is to study the so-called normal operator, which is the composition of the ray transform with its formal L2 adjoint. And uh, in fact, it has a very nice decomposition. It's actually convolution with a, uh, a Reese potential or uh, you know, there's a monomial part. It's uh, in the, uh, it, it, it is almost like Reese potential, but you have some monomial sitting in there. And uh, so when you consider Fourier transforms, it corresponds to derivatives of the Reese potential. So uh, what we're going to do, uh, is uh, uh, or what was done in Shara, uh, in, by Sharaf Pidinov is to take the Fourier transform on both sides, and uh, because this, because of this convolution over here, it converts to a product, and because of this monomial sitting on top, it's going to correspond to the derivative of the Fourier transform of the Reese potential, and uh, then it's a manipulation in it's a, it, so it becomes an algebraic problem. And uh, so just for the record, so the if you have the reach potential, the Fourier transform is going to be of this form. So you have to exclude certain points, which is given over here. Okay, 
All right. So now if you consider the Fourier transform, this is exactly what you get. So the Fourier transform of the normal operator uh, is going to be uh, the derivative. So these derivatives are not surprising because of the fact that you have these monomials over here, xj1 up to xjm, xi1 up to xim. So that corresponds to these derivatives of the Ries potential uh, in the Fourier space. But the Ries potential, the Fourier transform of the Ries potential also is of the same form. That's the content of uh, uh, content of this content of this result, right? Okay. So now what we have is uh, so we have this uh, this this relationship, and the goal is to recover. Uh, of course, you know, uh, ideally one would like to recover this f or f hat. If you recover f hat, then it's also fine. But because of the fact that there is a kernel, uh, it is obvious that you cannot recover this f hat, right? And that's where the, the solenoidal potential decomposition comes in. So you put the additional assumption, the fact that F is uh, divergence free. And with that, you can actually do uh, a recovery. And this is again, you know, it's not new. It's, it's there in Sharap Fridenov's book. It's due to Sharap Fridenov. Excuse me, what about, what about the normal operator? Is it bounded in L2, in, in L2 norms? Um, okay, so the thing is, uh, you can you can you can think of it as a distribution. So it's uh, uh, the both sides are interpreted in a distributional sense, uh -huh. okay. right? This is a distribution. NMF is a distribution. So this is the Fourier transform interpreted in a distributional sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now what we have is this. Um, I, I don't want to give the full the, the full general result is worked out in Sharp sure, enough. It's a long, long, uh, you know, it's a long formula. But for the case of symmetric two tensor fields, uh, the solenoidal part can be recovered from the normal operator through this procedure. And uh, what is of interest is the fact that you have this minus Laplacian to the half over here. Um, and uh, which means that the inversion formula, the explicit inversion formula, Recovering the solenoidal component of F uh, is non-local, and uh, okay, there is also a non-local part over here. This D here is the in, in the inner derivative. This J and this I are algebraic operations. Uh, I'm not I'm not very uh, I, I don't want to get into what what that is, but uh, uh, okay, you can think of it's exactly J is the contraction with the uh, Euclidean uh, the Kronecker delta. Okay. So now the so the fact that if you have the ray transform, then you can only recover the solenoidal component. And the natural question, and this is again was uh, is is it was addressed by Sharap Fidenov. Uh, a natural question is what additional information would lead to unique recovery of the entire tensor field. And the one thing that he proposed in his book uh, was momentum ray transforms. So instead of looking at uh, just the ray transform, you also look at powers of this t, this t to the k. So it's i k f of x comma c is t to the k. When k is equal to zero, it's exactly the rate transform, but now you have this additional information. And uh, uh, a uniqueness result, not explicit inversion, but a uniqueness result was actually proven by Shrafidinov in his book. So what he proved here is the following, that rank m symmetric tensor field is uniquely determined by these m plus one quantities. Now, why m plus one? You can think of it roughly speaking in the following fashion. Although you know what spaces it has to be, uh, it's not very clear. But uh, from the ray transform from i naught, you can recover the solenoidal component. Now, what you can do is you take the potential component, and from the potential component, uh, which is so d v, where v is now m minus one tensor field, you again do a solenoidal potential decomposition. And then this I1 would give you the solenoidal part of V. And then you just keep on going, you know, uh, this is not a theorem, but this is uh, uh, roughly speaking an idea as to, uh, you know, why M plus one is required. It's precisely because of the following reason that you can, you need M plus one information to actually recover the entire tensor field. And a uniqueness itself was shown. And in fact, uh, together with Sharaf Fidenov and uh, two of my colleagues, we actually gave an explicit inversion formula, 
Um, so I, I, one word of caution uh, is that uh, momentum rate transforms, we do not know of any real world applications where momentum rate transforms arises naturally, but nevertheless, it, it, it appears uh, in, a, in an indirect fashion. So one indirect fashion where it appears is in the uh, is in the inversion of conical radon transforms. So for instance, it worked, it, it appeared in a work of Kuchment and uh, Terry Zogel, one of his former students. And another application uh, where it actually came about uh, is, is, sorry. Oops. Uh, I can't see anything. Me too. Uh -huh. uh, it's all blank. Just, just one second. Uh, let me just stop sharing and then I'll come back again. Okay. Yeah, this is better. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen now? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. Uh, so we all covered this part. Um, sorry. Yeah, we covered this part as well. Yes. So the momentum rate transform, recall that it is T to the K. And then, uh, so when K is equal to zero, when only one information, that's the rate transform, the usual, what, what is called as the longitudinal rate transform. And uh, uh, as far as I understand, uh, or as far as I'm aware of, there is no real world application of momentum rate transforms, but it, it appears in an indirect fashion. And uh, so one place where it appears, actually, just one second, you know, this is kind of distracting me uh, because, uh, uh, just give me one second. Okay, so I just had to remove those uh, shading things. Yes, so the range, so the, uh, uh, so we do not know of any real world applications, but the momentum rate transforms appears, for instance, in uh, uh, Calderon type inverse problems. Uh, to prove uniqueness result for Calderon type inverse problems. It was uh, a joint work with mine with uh, two of my former students, Sumbuddo and uh, Suman. And uh, it, it, it has also appeared in other applications, for instance, in a work of Suman and Miko Salo, uh, where they consider lower order anisotropic, uh, uh, you know, Calderon type inverse problems, but linearized Calderon type inverse problems with uh, anisotropic perturbations. But the difference between this work and this work is that here, because of the linearized, uh, you know, it's a linearized Calderon inverse problem, they're able to uh, prove uniqueness result up to 2m minus one order. So if it's, a, if it's a polyharmonic operator that is minus Laplacian power m, then they can go all the way up to 2m minus one. Whereas here, with these methods, we are only able to go up to order m. And in, in, this, in, this, in this setup, um, the Calderon, uh, the uh, momentum rate transforms has appeared. Okay, um, all right. So now let's get to the preliminaries of momentum rate transforms. So um, 
because of the fact that we are restricting our X and C to be in TSN minus one, um, you know, the momentum rate transforms as a natural extension to all of Rn cross Rn minus zero. So the advantage being you just use the same definition, but the advantage here is that you can differentiate in the X and the C variables freely. Otherwise, you have to consider differential operators on TSN minus one, which makes it a little cumbersome. But you can you can consider these extensions, and uh, uh, the uh, one uh, complication when working with momentum is that uh, you do not have homogeneity, uh, you know, uh, simpler homogeneity in the first variable uh, compared to what we had for the case of rate transfer. So, for instance. If you consider the j k, that is the k momentum that is t to the k, then if you do this translation along the line, then it also depends on all the momentum, including that and everything up to zero. That is starting from L is equal to zero to k. So the point being that the starting point matters as far as when you consider momentum rate transform systems. Anyway, so now coming back, uh, what we have is this. Uh, so if you consider the, the, the momentum rate transforms, but restricted to TSN minus one and the extended momentum rate transforms, that is now each interpreted as being on Rn cross Rn minus zero, one can actually prove that this information and this information, these are equivalent. That is, you can go back and forth between these two. So the advantage is that instead of working with this, we work with this. And uh, the and one advantage of working with these extended operators is that you don't need to consider differential operators on TSN minus one uh, to prove your results. So what is the result that we prove? So this uh, uh, let me not you know for short of time uh, let me not get into this momentum rate transform and Fourier transform, but uh, let me just give you the uh, the inversion formula. So the inversion formula is this. So this is actually right now it's five year olds. Five year old result of uh, of mine with uh, two of my colleagues and of course Sharaf Fidinov, uh, which tells you that uh, given this uh, momentum rate transform, uh, you can recover the rate transform of each component of the tensor field through this nice algorithm. And once you have the uh, the rate transform, the usual rate transform of each function, then there is an inversion formula. Of course, the inversion formula is non-local, but nevertheless, this is the this is probably the best that one can achieve. Uh, that uh, you know, given the momentum k is equal to zero up to m, that is t t power zero up to t power m. So if you if you consider those m plus one moments, then from that information you can actually recover the rate transform of each component of the tensor field, and uh, then you can actually recover each component of the tensor field using an inversion formula, using the usual inversion formula. Which is given over here. So it, it is it is non-local minus Laplace into the half, and this is the averaging of this is a normal operator. So it's the averaging operator. Okay, all right. So now what is the goal? What we want? So what is there to do next? So the 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 idea be, here being the following is that instead of working directly with momentum rate transform, what we want to do next is to work with normal operators. And uh, the normal operators being the composition of uh, the momentum rate transform with its corresponding adjoint for each k. And uh, why would why would one do that? Well, the the reason being this that normal operators being averaging operators because it involves an integral over s n minus one, uh, it could you know potentially represent a better me measurement model than knowing the rate transform. Of course, if you know the rate transform, then you have the corresponding normal operators. But the fact that you have the normal operators does not necessarily imply that you have the corresponding rate transform. So, so what you want to do is you want to work only with normal operators, not with the rate transforms themselves. Because if you use the rate transforms themselves, then we have this inversion algorithm, uh, uh, which I just showed you over here. But now we cannot work with this JK. We have to work with the corresponding normal operator and then see if we can actually come up with a, an explicit inversion formula. Okay. So, um, so the strategy here is the following: uh, is that I have the rate transform, right? Of course, I do not have this information, but what do I have is the corresponding information of 
this normal operators. So this is the formal L2 adjoint, which is the averaging operator. And the fact that you have this Xc to the K, uh, this comes about because of the fact that you have the uh, momentum. So the T is the inner product of X and the Xc variable. And uh, this was an earlier result where we, uh, where we use this, uh, the normal operators corresponding to momentum in a, in a unique continuation result, which actually presented a couple of diffraction terms. Uh, or I, I think so, or maybe, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, anyway, so it was a unique continuation result. Uh, but in that context, uh, we studied these normal operators. And uh, it, is, it is very similar to what, what one encounters when one studies the rate transform. It is a convolution of F with uh, some monomials, product of monomials, and then you have the, uh, the Reese potential. Uh, but you have also these extra terms. And uh, you know this makes it a little complicated to work with, but we we actually um, do an equivalent uh, transformation, um, and the transformation being the following: that you can actually uh, it's a little uh, subtle. If uh, uh, so, here you see that this x p one these terms over here appears outside of this convolution. So what we actually want to do is we want to put this inside this. In other words, we actually do, um, uh, so we, are, we want to absorb this xp1 up to xp2k minus l into this f, but nevertheless it can be done. And the point being that then it actually becomes a convolution of some tensor field, but now it's a bigger tensor field with some monomials divided by the Reese potential. So the advantage here being in doing this is that now I can use the Fourier transform. So it's going to be the Fourier transform of this times of Fourier transform of this, and then see what, what actually comes about. So um, the Fourier transform now becomes, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a product, right? Because it's a convolution, it becomes a product. But now um, the derivatives have grown compared to what, uh, what one encounters in the case of uh, ray transform. Uh, and then, so we have, these uh, the derivatives of the Fourier transform of f hat and these derivatives come about because of these monomials present over here and so now you have those derivatives of this f hat because the monomials transform the derivatives and these monomials transform to these derivatives so the advantage here is the following is that uh, suppose i give you the following information that you have this nm0 all the way up to nmm the question is can you recover f if you have the ray transform, then you can transform the ray trans from the ray transform. You can do an averaging process. You can get the normal operators, and then uh, get an inversion. Okay, uh, well, it, the, what the inversion is not clear, but the point is, if you have the ray transform, then from the ray transform you have an inversion algorithm. But I am not giving you the ray transform. I am only giving you these averages, and from these averages you want to actually find what this f is, and that's what this procedure uh, shows about or what, what, what we are going to describe. Now, what we have done here is the following, is that we have converted uh, the normal operators in the Fourier space to a system of algebraic PDEs, because you also have these uh, PDEs over here. We also have these, uh, these derivatives can be you know, written down explicitly, but now you have a system of algebraic PDEs. And what you want to do is to recover each component of f. So, uh, how much time do I have, Professor? Professor, how much time do I have? So what? How much time do I have? Uh, excuse me, you have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's great. That's enough. Uh -huh. Now, if, if I were to consider k is equal to zero, then notice that there is no derivative present over here. And this, these derivatives, are, these L1, L2 up to LK derivatives are not there. And then you have these derivatives of this. This was considered by Sharaf Fidenov earlier. And of course, then you cannot recover this F hat. What you can only recover is uh, the solenoidal component of F, right? And with that, there is, a, there is an inversion algorithm which was given by Sharaf Fidino, as I already mentioned. Now, uh, one thing that is subtle about this is the following, is that 
if you were to consider a fixed k, that is, if you were to consider this fixed k, then this this equation seems to suggest that it's a it's a well determined system. But then you know there are several linear relations among these system of equations. Uh, that is, for each fixed k, uh, it seems to suggest that it's a it's a well defined system. Uh, or a well-determined system. But then there are a lot of internal relations which makes the uh, process quite uh, subtle as to how to actually go about uh, recovering the tensor field F. Okay. All right. So what we have here is the following, is that we have the following algebraic system of equations. These are all known to us. That is, this K here depends on uh, which momentum we are considering, which normal operator corresponding to the momentum. Now, uh, from k is equal to zero up to m, that is, if you consider the first m plus one momentum operators or the normal operators corresponding to those momentum, uh, we want to find out this f hat. That's the rule. Right? And uh, um, let me just take some open questions, which in our opinion are interesting. So for instance, if k is equal to zero, then it is known that uh, you can recover the solenoidal component of f, right? But suppose we give you a fixed k, not all k, but a fixed k, then what component of f hat can be recovered, right? And it's uh, it's not it's not known. And um, suppose suppose the system is not starting this algebraic system is not starting from uh, zero, that is k is equal to zero, but it starts from, let's say, some k prime to k plus k prime plus m plus one. That is, I give you some m plus one momentum. Uh, then is it is it possible that we can actually recover uh, something related to f hat? And it's again open. It's not, it's not, it's not very clear. Right. Uh, the other thing is if I were to give you a discrete set of m plus one momentum, then what is it that I can recover? That is also not, not there are a lot of, uh, in our opinion, interesting questions over here. But the following two questions we were able to address. So suppose um, suppose you fix an L, but L is L could be equal to M, but L, L, L can also be less than M. And suppose I give you for all K, that is the normal operators corresponding to those momentum, between zero up to that L. L can be equal to N, but L can also be less than N. Then what component of F hat can be recovered? And this is related to the same pendant operators are actually the generalized same pendant operators. Uh, this was, uh, this is there in Sarah Fridinov's book. And uh, in this case, we have a complete answer that is starting from zero up to L, where L, L can be equal to M or less than M. If L is equal to M, then you, the, the generalized saint Venant operator correspond to the identity operator, which in which case you recover the tensor field itself. Now, suppose you are given the following system. So this algebraic system over here, suppose you are, suppose you are able to, uh, suppose you have the following algebraic system of equations, k starting from zero up to m. Uh, so now we can forget all about momentum. It becomes an algebraic system of PDUs, right? Then can you recover the, the, the tensor field? This is the subject of this talk. And we have, a, we have a complete answer to this question. In fact, we have an explicit inversion formula. Okay, and this is the result. And the result is the following, that if you consider, let's say you fix an integer and a tensor field F in Schwartz, and suppose you have the following M plus one normal operators corresponding to uh, the, the first m plus one ray transforms, but you're only given this information, not the ray transform information, then you can actually recover the entire tensor field through this procedure. And uh, uh, this dk MNs, I have given the explicit uh, what these differential operators are. Uh, it's a little complicated, but nevertheless, these are different. This, you can just think of for the purposes of this talk, these are differential operators and uh, apply to these normal operators in the sense of distribution, of course. And then you have this minus Laplacian to the half, which is the which is what also appears in the context of uh, ray transform of functions and uh, ray transforms of tensor fields also. And the CKMNs are some constants. But this is the explicit inversion formula, recovering F from the first M plus one uh, momentum 
uh, transformers or the momentum operators. Now, uh, in the two, so can I take two or three minutes? You have uh, four minutes. Okay, yeah, I let me just describe, you know, the, uh, this is in the base space. The, the, the inversion formula is given in the base space. Uh, but if you go to the uh, Fourier space, it becomes this algebraic system of PDEs. And uh, uh, actually, it's quite easy. You know, once you once you recognize what needs to be done, then it becomes uh, you know it's not it's not very difficult. Um, so what you have is this: you have the following two system. So I'm I'm considering for the case of vector fields, and what you have is the following system of algebraic PDEs, algebraic system of PDEs. And then the goal is to recover the Fourier transform of each uh, component of the vector field. And uh, it's not very surprising if you're, if you're given these two, then what needs to be done is that you somehow try to eliminate uh, these third order derivatives. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, so you, you differentiate this and then you try to eliminate, uh, eliminate this and uh, uh, in the process, uh, you know, you, you have an explicit expression for this dij of mod y, and uh, through that you can actually recover uh, this f hat. Um, it, you know, once once you need, as I told you, once you know what needs to be done, then you know the system becomes a uh, little easier to handle. But the point being, uh, the uh, you know it's almost a miracle as to why it works, but nevertheless it works is that we are able to translate, uh, we are able to transform from a, an algebraic system of PDs to a purely algebraic system. And uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's, as I said, it's, to me, it looks like a miracle as to why it works, but nevertheless, it works. Um, I think I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. So are there questions, comments? May I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, rather stupid question. No, no, no. Uh, yes. If you have uh, square integrable vector field in R3, then it can be decomposed in uh, the, pot uh, the potential and divergent free part, right? Okay. That is just uh, Helgold's decomposition. Correct. And this uh, decomposition has uh, a very transparent Hilbert ba background uh, to have uh, to get uh, to get to obtain one of the components. You have just to project orthogonally in a Hilbert space on a subspace something like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What What about uh, What about uh, tensor case and? Uh, the composition of uh, tensor field uh, is it uh, similar interpretation? I mean, in terms of Hilbert projection for the components, maybe uh, it. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, after uh, if you apply Fourier transform, then it also very in the case of vector fields, it is also uh, very clear and transparent. You correct, have, correct. Right? Uh, do you have uh, something like this in the case of tensor fields? And is it used in uh, your uh, approach? Um, okay, so we do not. Uh, okay, so the thing is for the case of uh, tensor fields, the short answer to your question is I, uh, at least I have not thought about it. I do not know offhand uh, mm -hmm. right away whether it can be done. But uh, we do not actually consider projections. Uh -huh. um, because now the, the thing is, in, in let's say we consider two tensor fields. In that case, what you have are these, uh, you know, it's, it's like a quadratic form, right? And uh, uh, yeah, I do not know. I do not know the answer to your question. Uh, yes. I mean that maybe a normal operator is also something natural. Uh, 
uh, from the viewpoint of Hilbert, uh, uh, from the Hilbert uh, spaces, uh, and so on. And uh, may maybe it makes sense uh, to analyze uh, the Hilbert background of uh, uh, this uh, kind of results. Yeah, may definitely. maybe, but but I am not an expert, an expert yeah. in this field. Sure. Yeah. I will think about it. I'll think about your question. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have 